Hey everyone, it's Chrissy coming in at the top of the episode here just to once again handle content warnings and uh, housekeeping. This episode's content warnings are workplace abuse, indentured servitude, workplace death and injury, child and animal abuse, drowning and violence against seniors. Again, we do not delve too deeply into any of these. Uh, However, the first story tonight does involve a lot of workplace abuse. As always, because this is a paranormal podcast, we do have overall themes of death. Secondly, I would like to go over our Halloween special. Jill and I have lots of great plans and we want to get you involved. There are a few things you can do to get in on this. The first thing you can do, and we talk about this all the time, but we really want your personal stories. The Halloween special is going to be revolving all around you, the listener, and we want to celebrate you. The second thing you can do is we literally want to hear from you. We want to get a voice clip of you saying happy Halloween or happy Halloween from Maritime Supernatural podcast or happy spookening 2019. The third thing you can do is I'm trying to get the hashtag spookening 2019 trending on Twitter. Tweet that out with a link to our podcast and you'll get special mentions on the show. Third bit of housekeeping today is thank you to Daniel Luke, who is the composer of the intro music that you're about to hear. He's an amazing artist, animator, and musician, and you can find more of his work at webbot15.com. That's W-E-B-B-O-T-1-5.com. And the last bit, and this is specifically for Canadian citizens who are age 18 or older, if that's not you, feel free to skip ahead by about a minute. It's, this is not going to take long. October 21st is the Canadian federal election. I am not going to tell you who to vote for, who to not vote for. All I'm saying is get out there and vote for who you feel best represents Canada. If you cannot get to your polling station on October 21st, early voting is on now this weekend if you're listening when this episode comes out on October 12th. If you are a Canadian citizen out of the country, you can still go to elections.ca to find out what you can do. Not voting does not send a message. Not voting just takes away your voice. Vote for the leader that you want to best represent your vision of Canada. All right, so that's all. Uh, Just content warnings and hashtag spookening2019. Thank you to Daniel Luke. And please, Canadian citizens, go vote. All right. Have fun. Bye. Something wicked this way. Something wicked this way. Hey, everyone. Uh, Welcome to episode two of Maritime Supernatural podcast. I'm Chrissy. And I'm Jill. And you, you've made it. You made it to episode two. And I'm Woo-hoo. so happy that you're here. And I, I'm i sure Jill is too. I don't want to speak for you. I am really happy that they're here. Okay. Yay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, have you had any, it's been about a week since we last recorded and it's, it's still August at, as, a, oh, no, it's September 1st. That's right. It it's is. September uh, since, uh, at the time of this recording. Uh, how was your week, Jill? My week was pretty good. Nothing spooky or weird. Just doing the nine to five grind and coming home and researching spoops. That's been my week. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I went camping uh, for the first part of this week. Uh, yeah, we went up. We went up to Cape Breton, actually. Yes. Uh, in yeah, Fort uh, Marguerite Forks was where yes. we went. And uh, originally, we were supposed to be there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but Tuesday was a hurricane. And so we ended up spending the whole day, like, uh, either in the tent or driving up to Shetty Khan, like, checking it out. Um, So we didn't do, like, any camping stuff that day. So we wake up Wednesday, and it's, like, it's beautiful. It's sunshiny. We had, like, a, a tubing on the marguerite plant for Tuesday. Yeah. And we obviously couldn't do that because there was a hurricane. No. <laughs> and and so like Wednesday we we ended up going to like the guys out front. We're like, "Hey, so we're kind of thinking of 
staying another night because we t couldn't really do anything yesterday and like we still have like all of like we didn't even touch marshmallows all we had were Aww. uh pancakes and hot dogs like that was it marshmallows uh, are the camping staple right yeah. yeah and like we had like a ton of stuff to make s'mores um and so the guy was like, yeah, no, we don't mind if you stay another night. And yeah, like tubing is on today. So if you guys wanted to like, you know, join the uh, the crew today, we can we could take you down there. So I ended up going tubing. Uh, I did get caught in a beaver dam with uh, a woman whom I did not know at the time. But oh thank God. God she was. Yeah, thank God she was there because I, I did have a minor panic attack. Uh, yeah no. yeah but she was just like no 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 don't panic don't panic you're okay and like she was able to get to shore before i did so she was able to find like a long stick and like hold it up oh. to me so i could like it, like pull myself back in i was like trying not to get out of the tube but like every yeah. part of my body was just like get out of the inner tube right now and it's just like no you'll just end up like tripping over like wood and rocks and cutting yes. yourself and hurting yourself like don't do this even then i still got like these two nasty like scrape kind of cuts on my leg and like real cool bruises like they oh. they, they make me look way more rugged than i actually am <laughs> but it's still like yeah yeah okay yeah oh um, my god but yeah i went camping you can tell by my legs <laughs> yeah well that and like all of the freaking bug bites. Yes. Oh yeah. my god. The bugs are bad I, out there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like I have these great big, almost purple welts. Like they're crimson welts, of bug bites, and like they're crimson because I keep like punching them with my uh. fingertips because they don't have any nails, and so. Oh yeah. <laughs> but they're they're done the itchy stage now. They're kind of Good. sore, but like they're yeah. they're kind of past the worst of it now. So. Good. Yeah, I can't wait to go camping again. Yeah, camping's it, it, awesome. Yeah, it's, it, it might sound like I'm complaining, but I actually had, like, a ton of fun. And <laughs> I got to make corn over an open fire for the first time in 10 years, over yes. 10 years. And it was so good. Delicious. Ugh. Yes. So, yeah, uh, do you want to get into the stories here? Yeah, I am super ready. You're super ready? Do you want to go first, since I went first last time? Okay, sure. So what I'm bringing to the table today is a, another location. So um, this one is the Miners Museum and it is in Glace Bay in Cape Breton. And uh, have you ever been in a mine? Um, like a coal mine I've not, or anything? I've not been in a mine. Uh, I did get to go in there. There's a lot of caves in New Brunswick. Um, and part of my grade 12 gym class is that we got to go spelunking through one of those caves. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, so it's not technically a mine, but I have been underground. No. Yeah. Okay, so this mine um, was founded, I guess, sometime in the early 1900s or maybe the late 1800s. I'm not sure. Um and the museum itself kind of captures what it was like in 1932, I believe. Uh, but in 1925, there had been a strike. The conditions in the mine were awful. So they were being overworked and the mining company kind of owned that whole town. And they owned the store where they got their food, everything. So what the company would do is they would take money off of their the miners' paychecks, every paycheck, and just kind of cut the top off. Figured it was their own money because they were feeding them, they were clothing them, they oh were my Lord. they owned where they lived, everything. So they took the money off from the rent. They just kind of cut it all off the top of their pay. So That's none of the awful. miners, yeah, it is awful. So none of the miners had the money to, you know, get their make their place in life any better they couldn't save money it's basically indentured servitude yes mm -hmm. yeah and they had to work six days a week they never saw sunlight for the week until sunday when they were off Jesus. because they'd yeah they'd head there before the sun came up and they'd come home after the sun had set so they were just working 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 and they had children working there well little boys around the age of nine working in this mine oh my god 
Yes. And there are many deaths due to accidents, uh, you know, uh, walls caving in or the ceiling caving in. And uh, many men would die of the black lung, which is when you're inhaling too mm-hmm. much coal dust, you know, the black lung. So there was a lot of death, uh, just as with any coal mine. And uh, the community, you know, they would always know when there was an accident at the mine. It was well known. So in 1925, the miners couldn't take it anymore and they, they held a strike. Mm-hmm. So they raided the store and they burned it down, apparently. They were striking and the police officers shot a man and his name was William Davis. And they made, there is now a local holiday for the Miners Memorial Day, William Davis Miners Memorial Day. So yeah, it's it, it's a really big thing down home is Mm -hmm. all about mining and everything. I actually had a dog named Cole. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, now the Miners Museum is a section of this mine. It's called the Ocean Deeps Colliery. And sorry, what is that? The Ocean Deeps Colliery is the name of the mine and that's underneath the museum. So what Mm. you can do is go down into the museum and uh, experience kind of what it was like to be a miner back then. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've never been in a mine, but you mentioned you've gone into caves before. So to get down into the coal mine, you get, they would, all the men would pile onto this rickety cage. Well, it was called the cage and it was the elevator to go down. And, that you would get in and like it would all these like metal bars, you know, like the old timey timey sort of elevator. Yeah. And the, the it would hold elevator. Yeah. So it would hold 30 men and it would plummet 800 feet into the earth and it would shake from side to side as it descended. Oh. Yeah. So cool. you're going into this I'm... pitch black. And like all in this... of my phobias are like lighting up right now. Yeah, like it's it sounded awful. So the men, as they would descend, they would kind of joke and 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 try and make light because this was such a you know it's like an overwhelming and kind of frightening experience even just going of down course. there. And they knew the danger. They they've seen their friends perish. You know they've you know so every day was this risk they were taking, and they mm-hmm. had little choice because they had to eat, they had to live, they had to work. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, okay, so I remember when I was a kid, we went there for a, uh, a field trip. And, uh, I remember like, it's just the whole place is drippy and echoey and dark. And they did have some lamps in there, but you know, there are areas that just were so pitch black because there's no natural light. Yeah. That's, that's one thing with being underground is Mm -hmm. that light behaves differently. Yeah, it feels because, so weird. Like, the, yeah, it, I think it has something to do with like the air quality of it. Like Light can't really bounce through it the way it does out here. Um, and so like you end up with these really, really, really dark patches. Yeah. And it's like a wall could literally be right there, but until you have that light up against the wall, like you're not going to see it. Yeah, it's like the darkness creeps in a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I remember walking around down in this mine and I was a little kid. This was the nineties and, um, we were there with school and I remember it feeling just really surreal and part of me just wanted to break off from the group and be alone down there for some reason. And I would, I was kind of like wandering near this, uh, offshoot and I could, f- I felt like I could see things moving, but mm-hmm. then I, I'm not sure if it was just, like, the shadows ricocheting off, you know, like, how you were saying, like, the light plays funny down there. Yes, yeah. Uh, but I remember people being like, who's that? Like, who's down there? And, and we just kept, you know, seeing tricks of the light is what I'll call it. Yeah. So it was just really scary. Just being down there was scary. And you're looking around and the ceiling's being held up by these wooden beams. You know, it's just a spooky atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So I was doing some research on this museum and the, uh, the Cape Breton Post, like the local newspaper had done a, a write up on it. And it also made it into the Chronicle Herald, which is the Halifax paper. And the executive director of this museum, uh, reported that when she was working there by herself, she would hear footsteps on the stairs and, you know, she would check and she was definitely alone. 
and also doors slamming in this lonely, mm. creaky building above the museum. So she would, you know, get spooked out and, and everything. And I think there, like in the article, she had a little dog with her. And I'm assuming <laughs> that would make it a lot less lonely if you brought yes. your pet into work. Yeah. And if you're hearing like phantom noises, it's so easy to just be like, oh, it's just the dog being weird. Like True. You can just yeah. blame it on the dog. <laughs> yeah. I mean, while the dog's like... Sleep like it's not me. <laughs> Especially when one time she actually heard a man sneeze. Oh, not the dog. I hope to God it's not the dog in that one. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I was thinking, like, is that from all the dust coming up from the mine? Like, the ghosts are still, you know, affected by this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that it was actually the dog being affected by all the dust coming up from the mine. Oh, <laughs> a chew. Maybe. <laughs> a, a chew. <laughs> Floofy? Was that you? Floofy? <laughs> <laughs> so so Mr. Floofy Bottoms Mr. Floofy Bottoms are you okay do you need a Kleenex Mr. Floofos yes please <laughs> oh my god I mean be... woof At woof yeah <laughs> um, so yeah so I can't even imagine trying to be around this kind of already uh, spooky place you know mm-hmm. fraught with death and destruction and, and turmoil and you know, just all the things that have happened with this mine and you're working there alone and you're hearing these things like that's super spooky. So yeah. I wouldn't want that job. So um, the tours themselves are run by ex miners. So they're, you know, in their seventies and they've actually worked in the mines and they run these tours for now. That's so amazing. one of, yeah, so I can't, I feel like it would be really hard for me to have lived such a hard life and kind of willingly go back in there every day to to share this with other people. But I do think it's really important to know what their lives were like because it is a large part of the Cape Breton history and, you know, history of miners in general. Yeah, and I I have to imagine there's also some... Um, some amount of healing that goes with it as well. That's a good point. Because you're, you're able to like go back and experience these things with others in a safer environment mm-hmm. um, and let them know what you went through and let them like you're basically telling them like one of the hardest parts of your life and it's free therapy. Well, not free therapy. You, you get paid for this therapy basically. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really important to be able to share that with the population mm-hmm. so this <clears throat> this particular tour guide uh was going down into the mine alone like maybe checking it out or prepping it for the day's tours mm-hmm. and he could hear the voices of men talking oh so he called out but nobody replied since he was alone and there was nobody else down there when he turned to leave the voices would start up again so, you know, you turn your back and then the voices start up behind you and you're down in this pitch black mine with a couple of lights and, you know, you've just come out of the cage rattling its way down the chute. It does make me think of, like, the the stereotypical, like, bitchy high school girl where it's just like, oh, no, we went, we went talking. We went talking about you. It's fine. <laughs> oh, my God. Do you see what he's wearing? <laughs> Oh God, get all those boots. Those oh. men are so judgy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mining men are very much like high school girls. It's fine. We're assuming. We're assuming. We're assuming. Yeah. <laughs> you know how it is. Yeah, just what else are you going to talk about down there? Mining is so clicky. Like, you you either get in or you get out, right? Like. <laughs> so, uh, so if I was, I would have. Booted her. I would have gotten out of there if I had heard voices that weren't yeah. mine. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was looking at pictures down there. And uh, back when I went down there, I didn't have a camera. It was the 90s. We didn't just have mm-hmm. cameras on us. Yeah. It was a big deal to go get one of those disposable cameras. Yes. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I didn't have a camera back then. But I was looking at recent photos of down in the mine And one thing that really struck me from these photos is just how quickly the darkness kind of cuts off the flash. So Mm. you're like, I feel like in like in pitch black when you're taking a photograph and then, you know, some things are 
clearly visible, like the dust motes and the wooden beams and the walls, but then it just cuts to black because it's just this deep, dark cave, you know, man-made mm. cave. And one thing that's kind of interesting about this mine that they have open up is that it just gets like shorter and shorter as you go deeper and deeper. So it starts off and it's wide and, uh, you know, there was room for the ponies, the pit ponies to go in and, and there were horses that lived underground in these mines doing the work. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it was really wide at the opening and then it gets smaller and shorter and smaller and tighter. And then eventually you're like hunched over making your way through this mine. And it's just, I can't believe people spent their days working down there. And no wonder it's a haunted location because of all the pain and the, the agony that these men had to live through every day. And mm -hmm. then some of their untimely deaths, you know? Yeah. And like, of course, like the more cramped you're working can, like you're swinging a pickaxe yes like you aren't just like gently tapping like you need to get into the earth in order to find what you're looking for yeah and like i have to imagine like if you're in a in cramped quarters with multiple people somebody's gonna get a fucking pickaxe in them part of really my language, though but yeah. yeah and um also, like, I wonder if that's where the nine-year-olds would come in handy. Like, the shorter people would have to probably go in this tighter quarters. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's really scary, too. But, yeah, so that's uh, that's the Miner's Museum. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you... I, I mean, I could believe it being haunted. Modern mining is already extremely difficult, and there's tons of machines and trucks that are involved in modern mining. Like... You don't really get a pickaxe out unless you need to be extremely gentle with something, like you're testing things. Yeah. Um, but, like, I can't imagine, like, it's literally just all manpower and then, like, pony power to yeah. like, bring the carts out. Yeah, those, exactly. Those poor ponies, too. I like, know. They, they don't know what they're doing. They, they don't know what's going on. They probably don't have, like, helmet lights on like no they, they, not, they don't yeah. need to see yeah they're just like led around pulling the yeah the weight so god yeah so that's the the mine yeah. i mean nowadays i would love to go back in and see if it still has that surreal haunting feeling that it did when mm. i was a kid uh so that that's on my list yeah i feel like it's also like you and i are both quite introverted mm -hmm. so i feel like a space that is as dark and quiet as a cave it affects us differently than say like an extrovert or an omnivert would be affected mm -hmm. like because for us like we we find it um we find it relaxing to just be quiet and like kind of take in the atmosphere of a place and like yeah that's how we connect with spaces where somebody who needs light and brightness and sound and energy like it i imagine it must be much more stressful like of just like no no like i need i need to be talking i need to be moving like if this place gets to me then i'm going to get depressed like yes totally so, yeah mm -hmm. um there was one last thing in this article i was reading they brought down a spirit box and they were talking to a spirit and they apparently got the name fred out of it and that he was a miner from Cape Breton and after I had read this and then I went to look at photographs that were put up by TripAdvisor there was a horse named Fred <laughs> oh my God. so it had it had this horse like a model of a horse and then on the uh name plate it said Fred and I was wondering like maybe they were just hearing Fred from this thing because they had seen the word written, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I'm wondering if it was actually anything or if they were just kind of hearing things. I, I mean, there probably was a miner named Fred at some point Yes, in time. It's, a, it's a pretty common name. Yeah. Um, I Maybe the horse was named after the miner. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, like, I'm also thinking, like, it's not uh, untypical to find ghosts that are not from an area and who originally did not speak that language being able to speak the language like of the area um once they have passed away 
So I'm kind of like, I'm kind of wondering if like this horse was like, oh, I know that they called me Fred and I know I'm from this place. Oh. And so like it was able to kind of put that energy out there to be like, Fred, I'm from here. (laughs) Like, you know, yeah. My heart. Yeah. (laughs) It's like really cute and sad, you know? Yes. Yeah. Sad, cute. Fred the horse ghost. Suit. It's suit. <laughs> Fred! <laughs> like Fred! <laughs> Aw. Aw. Put some peanut butter in his mouth to make him look Aww. like he's talking. <laughs> Are you allowed to give horses peanut butter? Uh, it's how they made... Uh, I think actually his name was Fred the horse. Um, oh yeah there was like a an old tv horse that like it, i think it was on the johnny carson show or something and they would give him peanut butter so that he you would like move his lips a lot and uh-huh. then he they would just like dub over him so that it looked like he was talking oh that's so funny oh my yeah. gosh yeah huh okay well that's my that's my talk about the miners museum <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's very good. I'm just, I gotta look up this this horse now. Just Mr. Ed, Mr. Ed, the oh, talking horse. Yeah, Fred was close. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so he was trained to look like he could talk, but uh, if they needed to, they also had peanut butter on set to uh, to make it look like he was talking. Yeah, and I guess it was like a whole sitcom was based around this this talking horse. Yeah, I remember hearing about it now that you bring it up Mm -hmm. all right all right so uh we can go on to to my story Um, what is your story about well it's also uh about a it's also an area okay and it also has to do with mining oh Um, no way yeah yeah this is iron mining uh i'm going to be talking about the entirety of bell island newfoundland it is such a strange coincidence that we both have mining stories today. We did not plan this. No, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it's pretty wild. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so uh, a few fun facts about Bell Island. Um, it is considered not only the most haunted island in Canada, but the most haunted island in North America. Whoa. Yeah, so you go there, you're going to see some ghosts. Um, it could only be accessed via car ferry across the Tickle, which is a stretch of Atlantic Ocean between Bell Island and Portugal Cove. Okay. Good name. Yes, yeah. The Tickle. Oh, I'm just, just going for a little <laughs> tickle. Uh, uh, before World War II, it had a booming iron mining settlement in the town of Wabana with nearly 16,000 residents. 16,000? 16,000. Yeah. And like this is not a big island. No. Like it I think it's like 35 miles around or something like that. I I read. Wow. Like yeah. Due to a rich and complex culture cultural history with Irish, English, Scottish, Roma, German and Estonian immigrants, it has a very rich and complex lore. So there are stories of fairies and vengeful female spirits and lots of ghosts of miners. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, which is actually kind of typical of Newfoundland in general um, because of its very deep uh, and rich immigration uh, history. Mm-hmm. Like they've got they've they've always had people coming from Europe, like, you know, for like it's like one of the oldest like colonized uh, areas in Canada, I believe. Like it was like it was before like Spain and England like there there have been like i believe Norse stuff found on yeah <laughs> on Newfoundland yes like yeah it's 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 an old old place mhm um in 1942 german u-boats sunk four cargo ships resulting in the oh. deaths of 65 sailors um on April 2nd, 1978, there was a mysterious Bell Island boom, which was so loud that it caused damage to homes and electrical wiring and resulted in two perfectly square craters in the ground. 
It's unknown what caused the boom, but has sparked good discussions and debate about possible military testing or even extraterrestrial visitors. Aliens. Yeah, like, I I saw some people being like, guys, it was just lightning. Aliens. But it's like, <laughs> lightning makes perfectly square craters? Alien lightning does. <laughs> Alien lightning? Yeah, no. I'm like, yeah, no, that's, that's aliens, guys. It's aliens. I, I've already made up my mind. Um, Butler's Marsh in West Mines is said to be the home of gruesome fairies who stand at two feet tall and appear to be male and they lure unsuspecting visitors into the marshes to be lost forever. Uh, an old tradition on the island is to make children carry bread or a page from the Bible in their pocket as a form of protection from fairies. Nice. Wait, so, yeah, so... <laughs> how does bread protect them? I... See, like, this is something that I've heard before, that, like, there's something about bread that... Carbs. Carbs. Oh, they hate those carbs. They're on a (laughs) gluten-free diet. Makes sense to me. Uh, Yeah. And I mean, I kind of get the the Bible thing because... Yeah. You know, like, they... Religion supposedly saves you from all kinds of evil and stuff. So honestly, I get as that. as far as as far as fairies go, I'm more willing to believe bread than the yeah. Bible. <laughs> yeah, like it's like yeah. no, no, fairies are weird. You need something weird to like protect yourself from them. Like the Bible and, isn't weird enough. Like <laughs> and what kind of bread? I'm I'm gonna guess just any kind of homemade bread. I feel like white would be the scariest That's type what of bread. <laughs> That's what because I'm picturing too. Yeah, because it's like the most processed, isn't it? It's like whole grain. They'd be like, ah, that's mostly seeds. You're coming with me. Yeah. Oh, dope. I love the I love the grainy ones. <laughs> oh, look how seedy this bread is. <laughs> oh yeah. White, white bread. Comes, yeah, a kid comes away with white bread and they're like, Oh my god, the simple carbs. That's just gonna go <laughs> right so through me. Sugary. Ah. Oh. <laughs> it's like it's fine with butter but that's it god <laughs> it's like you're just drinking it oh <laughs> didn't we like i think we bashed bread in our last episode too like there was Did a ghost we? that was in the in a bakery oh really <laughs> i think i know we talked about bread here. i i think we just really like bread <laughs> i i love bread yeah uh, yeah um <laughs> So to, to bring it back down, unfortunately, uh, allegedly during World War II, some German U-boats had secretly docked on the island to restock and assess their plans. And it is said that an old woman stumbled across them, which resulted in her being dragged up to the marshes to be killed. Oh. Uh, the locals apparently heard her crying out for help, but they were afraid that it was fey tricks. And oh. so they didn't do anything to help her. What a sin. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, she has since become the Bell Island hag. Uh, I would too. Yes, yeah. I would absolutely. I'd be like, hey, fuck you. Yeah, <laughs> you that's you it. wanted to ignore me? Oh, you thought it was fake tricks? Well, now it's ghost tricks. I'm hagging uh, it up. Yeah. Uh, so it said that while wa- walking through the marshes, you may notice you are being approached by a woman in white. But as she gets closer, she will just rot right in front of you. Oh, her white, no. Yeah, her white clothing will turn to gray and her face will become, uh, quote, wormed out. Oh. Uh, if she gets close enough, she will eventually fall to her knees and she'll crawl like a dog with a terrible sulfuric odor. I hate dogs with terrible sulfuric odors. <laughs> They're the worst ones. That's really scary holy so obviously as she gets closer she becomes more and more decrepit and like she falls apart and it's like so by the time she like actually gets to you she's kind of harmless because she's just like (laughs) at that point just like a pile of dust just let her get close to you see how close (laughs) it takes for her to like just completely dissolve and like if she's not rotting fast enough, like take a couple steps back to just prolong. Yeah, yeah, make make you know, her just work keep for keep walking it. backwards, and she'll just keep <laughs> rotting. You know, like maybe she would have got to you as a skeleton, but you took those extra five steps, and she dusted away. 
<laughs> but I'm also like, maybe if you take a step back, she like reverse, it like reverses back. And so she's like, aha, I'm strong enough. Oh, oh no. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What if, what if you step towards her? I oh, yeah. Well, she then, what, well, yeah. Well, she like rot faster. She's like, <laughs> Well, I'm going to get you. I'm going to okay, wait, 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 no, 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 yeah, 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 stay, stay where you are. <laughs> yeah, she starts running away. She's like, hey, yeah, uh, I'm supposed to be spooking you. What are you doing? <laughs> yes, take me, hag mama. Yes, <laughs> take me, hag mama. <laughs> um, <laughs> like with my story from last episode. Uh, the Bell Island Hag was also one of the stories depicted in the Canada Post Halloween stamp collection My Haunted Canada in 2016. Uh, she was she also has a collector's quarter from the Canadian Mint that was also released in 2016. Oh my god! I want yeah, it. yeah. That's really cool. So yeah, so as terrifying as Butler's Marsh is, it is not the most haunted location on the island. What? That's the mild stuff. Yeah, that honor goes to the Wabana Iron Mines. Um, at 5 p.m. every day, there's a chance that you'll see a line of ghostly miners leaving the mines for their shift change. I read a story that before the mines closed in the 60s, there were a few miners just sitting outside, like, at supper time, like, right before the shift change, when the bell came. And it was Sunday, so it's like... They're just really on, like, watch duty. Like, they weren't working. But they saw a line of miners exiting the mine. And they were like, there's not supposed to be anybody in there. Like, what is this? And they realized as they saw familiar faces, oh, these were miners who were killed while working. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, There have been reports of a shadow man in Mineshaft 2, which is the only one that's open to guided tours. Uh, A visitor reported seeing the shadow man in a lower part of the tunnel she and her group was in. He watched the group for a short amount of time before disappearing. Shadow people seem to be a common theme in mines, because I mean, (laughs) like when we were kids, we saw a bunch of those in the other mine. Yeah, I, I think part of it is they they can blend in better so they can watch you better mm. it is my biggest fear to see a shadow man i hope to god i never see a shadow figure like they terrify me um phantom noises and voices and the sound of mining are often reported so much like yours there's still the sound of action and chatter mm-hmm. um even if it's just the people who work there like one or two people there they'll hear people talking down the mine at night, there is no lighting from the mine shafts. However, it is not uncommon to see what looks like lights worn on the helmets of miners coming from the tunnels. Bullet. Um, yeah, seriously. <laughs> Visitors have been touched on the shoulder and the back and have come across sudden cold spots while in the mines. <laughs> I wrote, I forgot I did this. I wrote in uh, parentheses, this one's a bit dubious in my honest opinion. <laughs> Actually... <laughs> You're in uh, a mine. Like, yeah. you're going to get cold patches. Yeah, it's true. I remember getting cold patches when I was down in the mine. I just completely forgot until you said that. <laughs> yeah, and, like, I I feel like I can't really speak to it because when I went to uh, the caving thing in my gym class, we went in February. Oh, no, we went in March. And so it's oh. like, yeah, everything's kind of cold. Like, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and no, like they certainly could be like drafts or something too, like in the mine. Yeah, I don't like, know how yeah, up drafts or anything down there. Yeah, or like just literally a pocket of cold air gets caught between walls, kind of mm-hmm. thing. Like there's no circulation, so the warm air that you're feeling, it could have been there forever. Like the cold air you're feeling, it could have been there forever. Like <laughs> mm. there's there's nothing. Um, women were considered bad luck to have in the mines, so it seems as though female visitors get the most interactions from these spirits. Oh. Uh, like, as a result. Yeah. Um, they are the ones who are mo- most likely to see things, feel things. Uh, they are the ones who are most likely to get grabbed. Oh, um, God. Yeah. Which, like, I'm part of me is, like, I want to believe that the miners are like, oh, shit, like, you shouldn't be here. What are you doing here? But... 
I'm also like, uh, I could also see them being like, oh, lady, let me grab soft flesh. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as, as horny miners do. So tourism is the main source of income for Bell Island. So even if you can't visit the island itself, definitely check out the Tourism Bell Island website. It is a cool math-esque trip. Like this like this is an angel fire website kind of thing like oh. it is amazing definitely like check out tourism <laughs> bell island i will yeah it, it's like all primary colors and like these like really basic drop down menus it's, it's it's super sweet you can tell it's like put together with like the local tourism board Yay! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so sweet i mean it's easier to navigate than the government canada website so yes yeah, <laughs> but that's a pretty low low bar, bar indeed. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's that's Bell Island in Newfoundland. That's awesome. I lived in Newfoundland yeah. for a number of years, but I never went to Bell Island. Hmm. In all fairness, did you have a car to get across on the car ferry to, across the tickle? Yeah, I do now. I didn't then. Mm-hmm. Well, there you are. Yeah, I'll have to go. Drive across the tickle. Yeah, drive across the tickle to meet the hag. The meat the yeah, I want to check out that head. Like, definitely terrifying. Yeah. But I want to know. Like, I want to do experiments with this hag, and then she just haunts me forever because I... <laughs> I'm picturing now, like... I'm just playing with her. I'm just picturing now a life with this hag and just, like, selfies and, like, going out for milkshakes oh God, yeah. and just having this wonderful friendship with this hag. But, like, she's only visible through, like, reflections or something. Oh, so it'd have so to, have to be, like, a selfie next to bathroom selfies. Yeah, bathroom selfies or, like, next to, like, big storefront windows. Or something. And, of course, anybody who doesn't know is just, like, <gasps> and, like, terrified. But it's, like, <laughs> oh, no, that's just my, that's just Haggy. Like, she's just here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Haggy. No, oh, Haggy, I love yeah. you. Haggy, she's going to be an Instagram uh, star. What's the, what's star? Yeah, what is it? Influencer, right? Haggy's right. gonna influencer. be an Instagram influencer. I can't wait. Yeah. I would follow in an instant. Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you want to get into some personal experiences? Yeah, sure. We uh, we still don't have any listener stories, which makes sense. These are not up online right. yet. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, I'm, I'm going to reiterate this at the end as well. If you are liking what you're hearing and you would like us to read your stories on the podcast, by all means, email us. It does not have to be maritime related. Uh, just send us your personal stories. It's all good. Anything We're going to read them all. Spooky. Yes. Yeah. And we'll we'll reply to you if they will end up in an episode. And, you know, we might just reply, thank you anyway. Yeah, that's all good. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, you can email us at maritimesupernatural at gmail.com. That's all one word, maritime supernatural. Um, and, yeah, so you you were mentioning some spooky stuff. Okay, so I have a story. Remember how earlier in this podcast you were talking about aliens and lights and stuff like that? Yes. Yeah. I've got one. So... I was camping in PEI, and I was a teenager, and I went with a friend of mine and her mom, and uh, we were camping at a campground. I can't remember the name of it. This was years and years ago. We were walking around on the beach. So we were talking and laughing and just having a good time, and it was nighttime, and there were these big floodlights uh, illuminating the beach, and that was nice. And we looked up and we were looking at the stars and it was just beautiful. Uh, so you were mentioning camping. So yeah, when you're camping, you can just see the sky and it looks like it goes on forever and the stars are gorgeous and it's just a wonderful experience. As we were looking up at the sky, we see this blue ball, just huge. Like it, it looked like it could have been the size of like a blimp or something like this massive blue ball just like zipped along across the sky a little bit jagged and plummeted behind the trees so we were like spaceship just landed oh my god so we went and we were walking up towards the trees and we 
Um, like it looked like it fell pretty far away. Like we wouldn't have been able to walk there. Um, so we went and we asked some fellow campers just randomly if they had seen anything and they weren't looking up, so they didn't see it. And we felt like, what the heck was this? You know? So we were asking Mm -hmm. around, nobody had seen anything except for us. And we went back down on the beach and there were these two like shadow figures just standing on the beach. They were kind of like short and we thought maybe they were like dogs at first because they were just kind of like two things standing next to each other, like kind of like moving a little and it looked like it felt like they were looking at us. So Uh we stood really still because we just kind of frozen in panic. We had just seen like an alien spaceship land. We had like nobody else saw it except for us. We went off alone onto this beach and there were these two things standing there staring at us. So we were frozen in fear and we were just kind of looking at it and the seconds were ticking by and they weren't moving either. And then we realized it was our shadows and we were just frozen in fear looking at our shadows (laughs) over this mound because of these big lights on on top of the thing. (laughs) Yeah. So anyway, we ended our camping trip and went home and I did some Google searches on if anyone had seen something land in PEI or anything and there was nothing. But what I did find was ball lightning and ball lightning is this type Mm -hmm. of lightning that manifests itself in the shape of a ball and it's super, super, super rare. But I do think that that's what we actually saw since there was no... That's fair. Yeah. It was really surreal and scary at the time but looking back i'm like i think that was just ball lightning (laughs) Mm -hmm. no that's totally fair um my my mom had a similar experience um this was when she was living in uh i don't know if she was living in riverview new brunswick but her sister definitely was because she had gone to visit her sister and she saw this like ball of fire just hanging in the night sky but yeah like it was bright it was like super bright Mm -hmm. and like it it was moving really slowly and she was just like what is that oh my god it's aliens it's of course definitely aliens it definitely is yeah yeah Yeah. like she was watching it in like her sister's driveway and she noticed like a few neighbors were coming out to look at it too and they're like what what is this and she finds out the next day that it was a really rare one in a million meteor events. Oh. So it was a, it was a meteor that she had seen, wow. but the way that it was falling, it made it like bright bright red and huge and bright. It was so eerie. Yeah, and yeah. Like, yeah. I can totally understand why in, you know, centuries past why humans would make up legends and lore about things in the sky because some of these natural occurring events are just so surreal and frightening yeah absolutely and like there's certain things that definitely you can look back and be like oh that was just a really weird freaky meteor shower like totally but then there's some things that it's like that makes no sense like we like there's no way to tell what that is Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. there's there's a painting that depicts um this event that happened in like rural England I think um of like these massive black figures not figures like people figures but like they they basically look like spaceships fighting in the sky like they're shooting lights at each other Mm -hmm. and then there's this big explosion and then everything's gone and back to normal Mm -hmm. people kept diaries back then journals back then um as best as they could uh and they they would find journal entries that it was about this crazy experience. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so there's that. Uh, I do remember this one experience I had. Um, I do believe that I saw a UFO once. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was laying in bed, and the way that my bed, like, I was eight or nine. I was quite young. And the way that my bed was positioned, I could look directly out the window and into the night sky. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like, at bedtime, I would just stargaze until I fell asleep kind of thing and this like these three lights that were all they were in the shape of a triangle Mm -hmm. they they kind of 
zipped past my window yeah like up in the sky and as they were going past they were rotating so it was like this rotating like three-point triangle yeah like and like to this day i i still don't know what that was like anytime i try to tell someone they're like oh it was a plane (laughs) it was a rotating plane (laughs) yeah it was just like oh yeah you know one of those planes that's one of those fidget spinner planes yeah, fidget spinner planes, like, back in 1998. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, that, that's that been my only somewhat experience with, with UFOs. I Like, to this day, like, I, I'm not sure if that's what I saw, but it's the, the only thing I can really think of that makes the most sense to me. Yeah. But, um, yeah. But if, you know, somebody's listening and they're like, oh, 1998, that's when they were, like, testing, testing out these thing. government yeah, planes. Totally. That, yeah, yeah, then by all means, contact me. Like, yeah. it's all good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my ghostly experience, I'm actually going to talk about the very first ghostly experience I've ever had, or that I, at least, that I remember. Um, this was uh, when... My my mom, my brother, and I were living in Riverview. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to give too many details, um, but it was in an area that had a lot of condos, and we we're, like, living in one of these condos. Yeah. Um, and I was around 12 or 13. At this point, I, I had very, very intense phasmophobia. So I was terrified of ghosts. Like, the thought of them, like, it, like the thought of seeing a ghost was so scary but at the same time i couldn't shake the feeling that we were living in a haunted house right so um something that uh, a quite common occurrence that i had was uh if i was up late and i went to have a shower i would feel this extremely angry male presence right outside of the shower wanting to jump in like wanting to jump in and hurt me that's terrifying yeah it was so scary but like it's like oh it's midnight it's super late i shouldn't even be up this late. i'm just tired and spooked like that's it that's all and i like i was able to shake that off um something else that would happen while i was in the showers that we had these like tiles that were like faux marble print on them and if i were to stare at them i would start to see skulls but again tired it's just my eyes playing tricks on me yeah whatever yeah but one night I was laying in my bed and I couldn't sleep. So I was like tossing back and forth. And finally I was just like, nope, I'm just going to like lay here and uh, I'm, I'm not going to move. Like I still had my eyes open and like I was like um, looking at like a, a entertainment system in front of me in my room. So I was just kind of like looking at that. And all of a sudden it was like, I feel like somebody's watching me. Like, uh... What is this? And I sat up and I looked at my doorway and Ooh. there's this little, <laughs> there's this little girl, probably like around nine or 10 years old, wearing this gray cloak with the hood pulled over her eyes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So obviously I screamed Yes. and I got my mom to come in and like, I, I don't think I slept with the light turned off for a week. Like we had to get me a nightlight, like 13 year old me, a nightlight. <laughs> Yeah, because, like, I could not be in my room in the dark. Like, I just couldn't be. Yeah, no wonder. Yeah, so we ended up moving out of there uh, when I was around 14. And my cousins and my uncle, they moved in. So it was, like, my older cousin, then her uncle. So my uncle and her uncle are the same person. Yeah. And then um, her young daughter, and I would oftentimes babysit her daughter. She was four years younger than me. Yeah. Or, you know, I'd just go over there after school and just hang out with her, whatever. Yeah. And one day I was hanging out with her in her room, which was the room that was mine. We're playing Mario Kart. Yeah. And she pauses the game and she's like, can I, can I tell you something? It's a little crazy, but can I tell you something? I was like, yeah, sure. Of course. You can tell me anything. She goes, okay, okay. And she stands up and she goes to the exact spot where I saw the little girl and she was like, I oftentimes feel like there's somebody standing right here. And, and then she goes into the bathroom and points to like the spot where I feel the, the angry male presence uh-huh. It's like, and there's like something really angry right here. And like, I told nobody about the angry male presence because yes. like, 
I, I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me. So why would I tell anybody? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And like my, my mom wouldn't have told like, like her, her niece, like my, like my, my older cousin there wouldn't have told her like about the little girl that I saw, or if she did, like she wouldn't have said by the door. Like, I don't even know if my mom knew the location that I saw the little girl. Yeah, exactly. Um, so like, I was like, oh, okay, well maybe I shouldn't be telling you this. But, and I told her <laughs> about the little girl. I didn't tell her about the angry, like, spirit in the bathroom i didn't want to freak her out yeah but like the look of like relief on her face of just like oh my god i'm not crazy like and, like someone <laughs> believes me and has experienced yeah. something similar yeah yes yeah absolutely and it's just like yeah no you're fine like i i don't think that little girl like i think that little girl just wants to be known that she's there yeah i don't think she's like angry or anything like but yeah, I'm like I'm not even I don't even want to acknowledge that male that male no. spirit. Yeah. Like he's so scary. Yeah, totally. Ew. So yeah, that's that's my experience is because I did tell a few there. But, yeah. yeah. Holy moly, that's the episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, thank you for listening to episode two of Maritime Supernatural. Uh, we hope that we'll see you again next episode that you'll tune in, you'll listen. If you want to find us online, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at MSN Podcast, just all one word. And you can email us, as I mentioned before, with listening stories or any kind of feedback at maritimesupernatural at gmail.com. Yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I did kind of take over the, the end bit there. We're still learning uh, the, the balance, the key to balance in our episodes. <laughs> no, you're doing um, great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. I love you. Rip in peace. <laughs>